who can't, several people who can't make it. Um, yeah. It so, might just be you and I. Well, I think there'll be, I, I expect a couple more, but um, here's, yeah, here's Gail. Here's, yeah. I have heard so much about Gail Fuller. All right. Hi, Jim. Hey. Hey, Hi, Jim. Gail. It's good to meet well, you. I, I've heard so much about you. Well, I, I've met you before. You may not believe that. <laughs> no, no, I was saying it was great to meet Gail. I've, I've, oh, I've Gail. So okay. Gail. Hi, Gail. Oh, Jim, your old hat, either. and I love it. <laughs> Hi, Kat. Hi there. Thanks for coming. You bet. I've heard so much about you. It's like we're old friends or something. I feel that way too. I'm so glad you said that. One of these days we'll get to hang out in person. Maybe I'll get to come to one of the field schools. Someday. Someday. Hi, Richard. Good morning. Good morning, Richard. All right. Um, and Peter, if you want to make me a co-host, I will okay. um, share my screen. So where is that? It's in the participants. No, it's in the... I think it might be you under, have to go to the participants list. Yeah. And as this is a Soil Carbon Coalition event, Peter, is there anything you want to say to kick us off? Or Yeah, I just want to want to say welcome everybody and we are recording this so that um people who can't attend can can catch up and cat is um a, she's been a me board member of the soil carbon coalition for a fairly long time she lives in vermont and I'll, I'll let her explain about the work she does and um but i hope that we have a chance to reflect on what she learned from her work and um, maybe do a, a circle afterwards and to emphasize what we've heard and what we'd like to add. Does that sound, sound okay? Sounds good to me. Hey, I'm hoping Kat will remember some of us don't know what's been going on well enough to uh, understand the context so thanks for keeping us in mind on what you've been doing and why you've been doing it yeah cat cat is um also a fairly close neighbor of dd purse house who um all of you know i think and um that she's in eastern in um eastern part of vermont connecticut river valley Looks like Abe's on the train. <laughs> Good for him. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll get started then. Um, this is my opening slide, and I forgot to put my name on there, but I'm Kat Buxton, and I live in Sharon, Vermont. Um, and I thought I would just start with what inspires me. And so here's a short list. Um, it goes on, of course, and if I had a lot of time, I would have put a lot of colors and patterns on here. <laughs> um, but plants, bugs, soil, and compost are, are really my, my big inspiration. It's what I love to spend my time with, um, learning from. And um, I'm also an artist and a musician. And uh, I'm learning that I actually care a lot about people, <laughs> which I didn't always think that I did. Um, and systems sort of surrounding how people operate with one another. Um, my business is Grow More, Waste Less. Um, so a lot of the work I do in the world um, goes through this business. Um, sometimes I'm, I just work as Kat Buxton and sometimes I work as Grow More, Waste Less. Grow More, Waste Less is just me, um, but I have had employees over the years that have helped me immensely and I'm probably due for another one. Um, so yeah, we connect communities to affect positive change from the ground up. Um, it started out really being all about food 
And then as I began to learn more and more about systems and the connectivity of all things, it just became about connecting communities. Um, one of the phrases that I use a lot is the social mycelium. I'm a big fan of soil. <laughs> I'm a, a soil geek. And I, I love the concept of mimicking ecosystems. Um, and the mycelium is so brilliant and so smart. And um, I just am learning so much every time I learn more about how biological systems in the soil work, I, I wanna be more like that. So the soil, my, uh, the social mycelium is a phrase I use to sort of get there. Um, one of the groups that I work with, so I'm gonna just start listing some of the, the groups that I work with either as myself or through Grow More Waste Less. Um, one is Apple Corps. And that's C-O-R-P-S, Apple Corps. Um, we are Upper Valley Apple Corps. That's where we're based out of the region of Vermont that is called the Upper Valley along the Connecticut River Valley um, on the western side, eastern side of Vermont. We plant fruit and nut trees in public places, all free for the picking. And we provide the education and skill support to care for the trees, pruning, um, understanding how plant guilds work. So on the right hand side there, you see a picture of an apple tree that is on the town green of the Hartford Town Hall. We have four trees there, two apples and two pears, and we plant guilds around them. And a guild is just a community of plants that help to support each other um, using some permaculture principles, um, understanding how plants function, uh, and what sorts of ways they communicate with each other, just like the mycelium. Uh, and then we do workshops to help people understand why we put plants all around our trees and we work with garden clubs to help them understand uh, why our gardens look so quote unquote messy. <laughs> um, we're really interested in trying to mimic nature and not really have what I call Lego land gardens where everything's in a row and nice and neat and all soldiered up. <laughs> more chaos is important. And we plant these trees in uh, the most urban areas that we have in Vermont, um, which we actually do have urban areas. Um, a lot of our trees are in White River Junction and the Hartford area. Hartford has five villages, which White River Junction is one of them. Um, we plant them in front of libraries. We've got trees at the Aquatic Center. We've got them at schools. Um, and on the left-hand side is a rain garden, also at the Hartford Town Hall. We have uh, six trees there uh, and gardens to support them that all need water and getting water has always been a problem. So we decided to install a rain barrel system on the band shell, which is that little building where um, all sorts of events take place on the green. Um, and the we have two 75 gallon barrels that collect water and then it overflows into a newly constructed rain garden that was all put in by volunteers. And those plants are native plants and food producing plants. So we're also doing some education about our trees. We will have a mural there next year by a local artist connecting uh, the sense of place. This is a really important place in that it is the confluence of two rivers. This has always been a special place for the Abenaki people that have been here for 10,000 years. And we wanna pull all of that in with understanding water cycles and why it's important to slow and sink the water. And that's Upper Valley Apple Corps. Um, we also have food forests. We have three food forests um, of varying ages. Um, some of them are so new that you've got to squint to see the trees and use your imagination to advance 60 years forward to when we'll be feeding the community uh, for those of us that might still be living at that point. We have a lot of fruit and nut trees, uh, a lot of plant guilds, medicines. Um, we'll have community gardening spaces within these forests and lots of places to sit uh, and places for outdoor workshops and classes. One of the food forests is in on private grounds, but it's right next to a park. Uh, that's the oldest one. It's about 11 years old. And it's been amazing to watch that turn from an abandoned lot full of trash into a multi-storied food forest that feeds a whole lot of people and animals at this point. The other two, uh, one is at a town park where we're working with a town committee called the Hartford Resilience Committee to um, take over a portion of a town park where they really struggled 
with soil health after Tropical Storm Irene deposited the river on top of this park, um, providing a lot of compaction. The town took to scraping and then using herbicides to try and control weeds, and, and they killed the soil. Um, so we've taken over and we've, uh, we're putting in a food forest and we're building soil from the ground up, which is really exciting. And we're having to do that while working with floodplain regulations that don't even allow us to bring in compost. So we've been, uh, we are allowed to bring in seeds. So we're using the power of sunlight and plants to rebuild the soil in this food forest. And it's really exciting to watch. The third one is an Abenaki garden. It is. It has been created by Abenaki elders in our area. And the Abenaki is the, the uh, band of people that have been living here for tens of thousands of years. There are many different bands within the Abenaki. This particular food forest is in Quichi. And it's, uh, we took over a portion of what was called the polo grounds where they have polo events. Um, and our Abenaki elders worked with the commission that owns that land to ask them to give the land back to the Abenaki. They've done so, and now we're building a food forest, so it's pretty exciting. Uh, and that will also be a place for storytelling and sharing for Abenaki people. All of the food grown there will be sourced uh, through Abenaki seed, will be grown out, and then given out to the Abenaki people in our region. Um, yep, compost geek. I love worms and bugs and compost and all the critters that make it happen. I love experimenting with different kinds of recipes to get different end result products. And I'm really interested in creating beautiful soil health amendments. So I have some interest in managing waste, but mostly I'm interested in, in cycling nutrients um, and reducing the number of fertilizers that people buy in. I like to talk about how no one's walking around the forest with a bag of fertilizer, making sure everything's balanced in the forest and how can we mimic that? And one way to do that is to recycle our nutrients. So in my compost world, um, one of my most exciting projects is called the Super Compost Project. And I'm just getting started. I've invited five supervisory unions to join us. I have a compost system at Thetford Elementary that I'll be showing just a little bit later. And that is the, the model for this super compost project. So far we have 25 schools that have signed up to be a part of this project. And so I'll be raising ooh, a couple hundred thousand dollars over this winter to support that project. Um, King Arthur has signed on as a supporter of the project, which is great. And we've got a lot of um, organizational support throughout the state as well and five supervisory unions. So that's pretty exciting. Along with that project, every school will get a fully functioning compost system built and delivered and installed. They will get two years of um, technical expertise from a team of providers that I'm convening. Uh, they will also get curriculum support if they want it. Um, and uh, the goal there is to build a community of practice within schools so that they can help each other to recycle their nutrients. And to give you a sense of the kind of um, volume we're talking about. The one school that I've been working with for 10 years on composting manages about 6,000 pounds of food scraps a year. Um, and that's about 150 pounds a week. And that's a school that's been working on reducing their waste. Most schools are about double that. Um, I also work as an on-farm compost consultant, um, usually with the Composting Association of Vermont. Right now we're in the middle of a project where we've been consulting with seven farms in Vermont and New Hampshire, and we've just applied for another USDA grant to expand the project so that we can go to 16 farms and possibly include New York State. And that is a project to help farmers learn how to compost better on their farm within the human systems that are needed um, on the farm. And so that can be everything from manure management to food scraps. And we're really hoping to encourage more farmers to collect community food scraps, um, partly as a way to earn more money uh, from their community, but also to reduce the amount of inputs that they've got to cycle in to their farms. So that's been really exciting, training new farmers, and I'm learning so much doing it. I'm also a um, master composter with the University of Vermont Master Compost Program. 
Uh, I run two service project sites, which means that when people go through the master compost project um, and they have to do their intern hours, they have 10 hours they need to do for community service, they'll often look me up and come and work with me at my two service project sites, both of which are elementary schools in Thetford and in Sharon. And usually what I do is I just have them turn compost with me. Um, and it's really amazing what they can learn from seeing different systems and different ingredients. Um, so that's been really exciting as well. I'm also a part of the Food Cycle Coalition, which is a farm to plate movement in Vermont. Um, there's a big organization called Farm to Plate run by the Sustainable Jobs Fund. And they do a lot of work in the state to um, convene groups around policy, around food systems, around working lands, um, and the food cycle. So I'm a part of three uh, farm to plate coalitions. One is the food cycle coalition, one is the policy coalition, and one is the agroforestry coalition. And as a part of the food cycle coalition, I helped to um, write a compost regulatory guide for the state of Vermont which is uh, unfortunately a really complicated set of rules to navigate through if you just wanna try to compost and collect food scraps from off your farm. Uh, so there's a regulatory guide now available to help people. Um, we're also involved with the Save Our Soils Coalition, which is a coalition that was created by Vermont farmers um, who are interested in managing food scraps on their farm as a part of a compost system and also chicken uh, foraging on compost piles. Um, and as a part of that, also trying to hold Vermont to uh, its word, we passed a universal recycling law in the mid, uh, I think it was 2015, which mandates that no food scraps are allowed to be in the landfill. And it also mandated a source separation guide and sort of a, a values-based way that this law was supposed to happen. Um, and if you picture an upside down triangle, the biggest portion is supposed to be food reduction, waste reduction. Then we feed animals, then we feed, no, excuse me. First we reduce waste, then we feed people, then we feed animals, then we compost. And then the bottom part of the triangle is methane digestion and making energy. The state of Vermont has really kind of flipped that around in the process of how the law has been rolled out. And we have a really big problem right now with source separation of food scraps. So it used to be uh, when the law first came out, stores and businesses uh, and institutions were trained to separate food scraps from packaging. And then came along this depackaging plant um, technology where you can take all of your food waste wrapped in plastic and put it in a big shredding machine that somehow magically removes all of the plastic from the food scraps. Um, none of us believe that's true and it's caused quite a contamination problem in our state. So the Save Our Soils Coalition is really working to hold Vermont's feet to the fire and um, make them follow the rules that they created. All of that relates to my work with the Vermont Healthy Soils Coalition, which is an organization I co-founded in 2015 after attending a um, soil sponge workshop with Dee and Peter and Walter Yana. And Walter um, encouraged us all to be bold. <laughs> and I thought, OK, let's be bold. And so I started this coalition. Um, and it has been pretty amazing. We have a board of directors. Um, I tried actually to dissolve the coalition last year and I was met with a very for firm no and four new board members. <laughs> so I guess we're doing good work. Um, we have a listserv that serves as sort of a virtual space where people are able to ask and answer questions and share information about ways to get involved in soil health. Um, we have a YouTube channel which hosts uh, videos from three years worth of what we called the soil series, uh, where we had um, all virtual uh, event. Actually, the first year was in person and the second two years were virtual because of the pandemic, um, where we had um, practitioners from Vermont talking about what they do on their farms, how they make biochar, um, all sorts of really amazing people in Vermont just sort of elevating the brilliance of our communities through the soil um, series. And those are all available on YouTube. We also have a website, which has a ton of resources. Um, and uh, we convene regularly with a bunch of different groups around soil health. 
So there is a bunch of letters on the screen right now. I'll go through those. The, one is the National Healthy Soils Policy Network, which is convened by CalCan. I believe there are 22 states involved right now. So we're a part of that network. We're a part of the Vermont Healthy Soils Policy Network, which is a group of many organizations um, and agencies and farmers. And we really have a lot of farmers. That's part of the goal to mend fences and build bridges to figure out how we can pass soil health legislation that does not divide farmers or uh, misinform the public about what farming actually is. Um, and so that's been a really effective network in Vermont. Um, we also have the Northeast Soil Health Policy Network, which is convened out of Tufts and Dartmouth. Um, and they're a little bit uh, of, of a different level, sort of academic. Um, I just shared with you all this morning, there will be a Northeast Healthy Soils Symposium uh, in March. And I suspect that the financialization of nature is gonna be a big topic there. <laughs> um, and then also the Save Our Soils Coalition, which I just described. Also as a part of the Vermont, Vermont Healthy Soils Coalition, um, Didi and I have been sharing a seat on the Payment for Ecosystem Services and Soil Health Working Group um, that was uh, assigned by the Vermont legislature after a group of farmer watershed groups came and presented to the Vermont legislature, the legislature suggesting that we hire farmers to um, deepen our in-soil watersheds. Um, and it was such a brilliant idea. And then it got shifted into a working group and it became really focused on um, specific nutrients and then really focused on uh, this idea of payment for ecosystem services. We met for three years. We just last Tuesday had our final meeting and uh, Dee Dee and I worked really hard on the final report. Uh, so we're hoping that when that comes out, that reflects that Vermont very um, determinately worked away from the financialization of nature and we do not support it. So we'll see what the report actually says, um, but we did avert a state-sponsored payment for ecosystem services program, which is awesome. We uh, ended up with a pilot program that brings in a state um, affiliate with the National Resources Conservation Service Conservation Stewardship Program, which is an existing program with the NRCS that is probably the best program out there that offers rewards in the form of money to farmers that are doing really good work on their farm. Um, so what we've done there is expand the inroad uh, and the bridge to get into that program and offer some state and national partnership, which is a really exciting move to think that the state of Vermont might actually work closely with a federal program to ensure that our farmers are getting the best possible services they can get. Um, now we're gonna get into a bunch of pictures. Um, so one of my most exciting projects uh, is Thetford Elementary School. I've been there for 15 years. Um, I started there as the education coordinator for Cedar Circle Farm, uh, which is in East Thetford, Vermont. And I ran their education programs. And as a part of that, I started working with schools. And this particular school had a school garden. So I stepped in and we just started building the garden out. It started out with seven raised beds. And we now have, uh, I think, 18 raised beds, um, six apple trees, two pear trees, a peach tree, raspberry patch, blueberry patch, uh, on-site composting system, and goats. So this is a K through six school. This brings me so much joy to work with these kids. And I've been there long enough that I've seen a lot of these kids graduate high school now. So um, that's been really fun and exciting to watch them move through the world. Oh, I want to point out one thing on the um, mural there on the top right. There's a little farm stand and a picture of a person <laughs> doing this. That's me. They painted me into their mural at school it's like my biggest honor in the world never to be topped um so at this school we have all these gardens and we really focus on fall crops um although as our climate is warming and we're getting earlier springs we're going to be changing some of that but we've always focused on crops that will be ready when the kids come back to school in the fall we do run the garden all summer long i'm i'm at this school every week 
uh, year round. So I go to the gardens once a week with a team of volunteers and we've got some people that come and water for us. Our food service director comes and harvests and prepares things so that when the kids come back to school, we've got refrigerator pickles and frozen kale and peaches with the skin off in the freezer, uh, et cetera. Um, we love this, this work at school has really um, shifted the culture at the school. It's really exciting. Families now move here so that their kids can go to this school because we have such amazing outdoor programs. Um, and I'm a catalyst, but I'm certainly not responsible for all of it. Um, this school is amazing. Um, this is an example of some of the fruit we grow. We used to grow cranberries um, and they lasted for eight years. I couldn't believe it, but now they're dead because um, they really do like water. <laughs> Um, but uh, the kids do all of the harvesting, um, they do all of the planting, they do the care for the trees, um, they even help with pruning. Um, different grades have different um, parts of the garden that they're involved with, so they're not getting a repeat experience every year is something new for them. And all of the food we grow ends up in our cafeteria, and so this is some of the stuff that shows up in our cafeteria. Um, that's Jenny, our food service cook and she is scooping out pear crumble made from our pear tree. Um, when we have a good year in apples, we do cider pressing. We have a whole school cider pressing day. Uh, we also make dried apples and all sorts of other things. We end up with lots of applesauce that goes in the freezer uh, for winter um, delight. Um, some years, this was pre-pandemic and we hope to do it again this year. Um, we took over an entire hallway with about 70 kindergarten through second graders who all prepared meals in their classroom from their garden. And then we had a long hallway of family style tables uh, where kids ate delicious food in the hallway that they prepared. So that was a really exciting sort of end product as well. That's what it looked like. And that's what our mail looked like. We had to have spaghetti because they're little kids and you got to have something <laughs> that those picky kids are going to eat. <laughs> um, the kids do baking at school. Um, they also, as I said, they manage the fruit. So on the left, we have a kid uh, working on pruning our raspberry patch in the early spring, their fall raspberries. <laughs> we do a lot of work around plants. I like to work with root systems. So I'll send kids out and ask them to find all the dandelions. And then we have contests who gets the longest one because you have to remove the entire root if you don't want it to grow back. Uh, and then we also, sometimes I'll send them out to send a, a, to find a specific on the left side there that is the ground ivy, very easy to identify. So we do very specific uh, weeding so that the kids are not just weeding, they're learning about the root systems of plants and also how they function. We have a compost system at school, as I mentioned earlier, where we manage 6,000 pounds of food waste a year. That is run by fifth and sixth graders. Um, they do all the work. They, man they collect the food scraps every day. Um, one classroom collects the food scraps, one classroom uh, makes the compost deposit and the classroom switch throughout the school year so that every kid gets an experience doing both. They take the temperature, they take the moisture, they calculate the weight of total food scraps and feedstocks, which are the carbon materials that we add in like goat manure and hay, wood shavings and paper towels from the school. And all of that populates a spreadsheet that then becomes part of the basis for their science and math curriculum. And this is some of the results that we get from kids. Um, this, Yep, so this was they're just learning their basic math using the chart of data that they created themselves. And the feedback we get from kids is that they really appreciate understanding where the data came from um, and how it's helpful. So the whole thing really works really well. Um, I also do land listening with the kids, um, land listening that I learned from Peter and Didi. Um, and so we use observation rings and water infiltration rings. Uh, we do visual soil assessments and we do some transects and mapping. So this is some of the kids showing the maps that they made at school. Here we are doing bio, biodiversity rings. Uh, and we also have all of this is put on a Google form. So we do have a paper version and then we have a Google form version where the kids can put all of their data in and it spits out a spreadsheet for them. Here we are doing water infiltration rings. and visual soil assessments. And here's some of the math that they did uh, using their observation ring data to show which parts had more living plants and which had bare ground. 
We also do a lot of work on water. Um, Today's water and soil are so related. Um, and so I do a lot of work with the kids in very space specific. So this is our schoolyard after a flood in 2017. And these pictures are now a part of our soil science syllabus that we use every year with fifth and sixth graders. Um, and they really like being able to identify the place and being wowed by the amount of water that was there. So then we talk about why did the water get there? We start engineering systems to move water around and end up working with soil health as the best system to move water around. Um, the kids have recently shown an interest in learning more about ocean dead zones. So we're gonna be incorporating that into our curriculum as well. We talk a lot about systems. I'm totally inspired by systems and there's so much to learn. So these are some of the systems we work with. And again, these are kindergarten through sixth graders. So it's pretty exciting that these kids are getting this, this basis. Um, and the soil health principles are a big part of our work. By the time these kids uh, graduate sixth grade, they can name all of the soil health principles and uh, describe what they mean. And this is a very popular slide and I just love to use it. One of the things I like to get people excited about is how much life is supported by those root systems and the photosynthesis coming from the plants above. And so just building that cycle and circle of interest and love for organisms and life. Um, so going on to another thing that I do, I work with Regeneration Corps, which is um, an organization uh, we found it in 2019, just before the pandemic, and then we launched during the pandemic. We work with high school age students, and we've started working with middle school age students um, around the intersections of climate change, regenerative agriculture, and anti-racism. We do a lot of work teaching about just transition and climate change solutions, and we really work hard to get kids outside on farms. Uh, we do things like help schools plan a new schoolyard. Um, we get we've gotten kids out on farms to plant pollinator buffer strips on a, a market dairy farm, uh, vegetable garden and market uh, dairy. Um, we have kids coming to food for us. Um, so we've got eight farm hubs. Uh, and right now we're just in the upper valley, but we're starting to expand up into the north country of Vermont um, and into central Vermont. And we have a lot of interest in southern Vermont, but we are only four people the equivalent of one full-time employee. And I put a link to our um, annual report. It's our first ever. It's really pretty amazing. Uh, so I encourage folks to check that out. Um, this year uh, in 2022, we worked with over 200 kids. We planted five tree nurseries that have at least 100 trees each in them that the students will be taking care of and getting out to their permanent homes. Um, we have worked with 10 schools, and one of the most exciting things to me is that we have this Regeneration Core Collective. Um, so every other Friday for an hour, we offer space on Zoom for a what we call mycelium meets. And we have up to 40 educators now joining our calls, not all at the same time yet. It's hard for teachers to join, but sometimes they do. We have farmers joining, we have education organizations joining, we've got some water scientists, um, the New Hampshire Academy of Sciences, um, NOFA Vermont, Rural Vermont, all sorts of great groups. And in this space, we share resources, we collaborate, and we figure out how to lift each other up and not compete to educate our students and shift the paradigm. And it's been really effective. Um, we've got a bunch of trainings planned uh, for all the educators to come and learn together about how we can do this work better. Other projects I'm involved with um, a little more tangentially is the Agroecology School with Via La Campesina, which is an international organization. Um, uh, Rural Vermont has been working with them for about a year now. Um, we had a big agroecology convening in Marshfield, Vermont this summer. And it has been decided by the international partners that Vermont will be the place for a North American agroecology school. So it's in the process. Um, right now, it's, uh, there's no physical location. We're not even sure there will be. Um, so there's a whole network of people working on this and everyone is invited to participate. Um, so if folks are interested, they should get in touch. I also like to lead land listening workshops to anyone who will listen. Um, I've got an elective coming up at a local high school where I'll be teaching land listening for a month. 
um, in a one and a half hour class, four days a week for a month with high school kids. So that's going to be really exciting as well. Um, and uh, as a part of community organizing, we're developing a lot of different sort of resilience hubs where many organizations or towns or groups are working together to make sure that they know what each other is doing. And again, finding ways to lift each other up to pool resources, to collaborate on funding. Um, and it's been really effective and exciting to see. So one of those is in South Royalton. Another one is in Hartford. Um, and uh, that's with Upper Valley Apple Corps. We have a bunch of different sites and projects that are, they need some weaving together. So we're working uh, with Vital Communities, which is a big organization in our area. Um, to build a resilience hub in Hartford, along with seven other hubs throughout the Upper Valley that Vital Communities is convening. And this is all around food sovereignty and food security. So the work of Apple Corps and planting fruit and nut trees and having food forests is all a part of that. So we're excited to be advancing that work. Um, and the next level of that work is actually working more with town committees and normalizing the work that we're doing rather than have it be so fringe. And I'm on three boards of directors, Rural Vermont, Vermont Healthy Soils Coalition, Soil Carbon Coalition. My husband and I are starting a farm. This is our farm sign. And those are some of the things that we hope to be producing. Um, we're just getting started. We're two years into this land. So we're building soil and planting trees and really working on the understory of our forest. We've got 22 acres of forest that was um, uh, groomed for firewood for about 50 years. So there's very little in the way of understory. So we're working to rebuild the understory and bring in more food. And um, I'm in a band, I'm a musician. I <laughs> sing and write music and play in a band called Wool. And we host an open mic every Monday in Randolph. So what I've learned, oof, I'm learning so much. Here's a short list. Um, you know, when I started all of this, I, I really liked to be uh, in solitude uh, with the plants and the bugs and the soil. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll step back just a little bit before I started all of this work. Um, when I, I was in my early 20s, I rode my bicycle across the country with my husband. Um, we rode 9,000 miles. And um, our goal was to see the country and to kind of get away from people. <laughs> and it turns out that on that trip, I realized um, how much I like people and how important it was to learn how to communicate better with them. And so since then, I've been incorporating that sort of social um, mycelium work into all that I do and trying to include more people and um, be a better listener uh, and a better learner and um, sort of contain my ego and maybe let it go. Um, and taking risks and um, breaking norms and uh, being a little rowdy and having fun. Those are the things I like and I'm ever more curious. And that's it. <laughs> Well, well, thanks. Thanks so much, Kat. Um, that's inspiring and, and almost overwhelming. <laughs> <laughs> and your the, the number of things you're involved in and the number of connections you make is is amazing. I, I really um, am inspired and blown away by it. Thanks. And I would like to you know, go around the room and reflect on what we've heard. Um, and I guess, I guess I can start. Um, for some of you who we don't all know each other, so let's let's do a little bit of introduction first. I'm Peter Donovan. I live in La Grande, Oregon, and I'm the one of the founders, along with Abe, of the Soil Carbon Coalition in 2007, and um, I, several years ago, Kat came out and helped me do a, a 
a uh, course, a, kind of a land listener workshop series with the uh, in the Central Valley of California, which I'm going again next week, and shared with me some of her um, gifts and and ways of working with with kids, and that was that was great, and I really appreciate what what Cat has done. And I visited the Thetford Elementary School Garden um, a couple times anyway. And but I I, I wonder um, I have some questions for you, Cat. But maybe maybe we should wait till we go around, and maybe maybe you'll have a, a chance to answer them. And my question is, how do you keep all these things? separate or connected this that's that's a that's impressive to me so let's let's um introduce ourselves and some reflections on what what we've heard from cat and let's start with you gail and then richard king will be next uh do you do you want an introduction or just Thoughts yeah. on the presentation right now. Both. Uh, so I'm Gail Fuller, and along with Lynette Miller, uh, we run a, a farm. We're in Severy, Kansas. Uh, my 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 bio can get very lengthy because I'm I'm old, and if you live this long, life gets pretty interesting. So. <laughs> Uh, I, I grew up on a family farm in Kansas, or what would be considered a pretty typical family farm in Kansas. Uh, my brother and I split it up in the 80s. I took over the, the row crop, and he took over the grassland management. And by the year 2000, I'd grown it to the fourth largest row crop farm in my county. We were farming 3,200 acres of Roundup Ready corn and soybeans. Uh, we had, I had switched the farm to no-till in the early 90s. And in 2000, uh, I realized that no-till was just a tool and when not used properly, it, like chemicals or anything else, was, could be a bad tool. And I, somewhere between 2000 and 2002, I finally learned that there was such a thing as the carbon cycle, water cycle, mineral cycle, and that soil was a living a living being, all things that I was never taught in my farming career. And at that point, the farm, change directions and Lynette and I, or I went on at that time Lynette wasn't involved yet but I went on a sharp learning curve learning about soil biology and all the things that we've been talking about here today uh, and the, the farm became very successful environmentally and financially until 2012 when the government intervened and didn't like the way I was now managing and they took away my crop insurance which sent me on a two year battle with the government and lost my operating line of credit with the bank, which put me in near bankruptcy. Uh, I won the battle if there is such a thing with the government, but they won the war because I was already, they'd already broke me. So winning didn't really matter at that point. Uh, it was really the best thing that ever happened because it forced Lynette and I to move away from the commodity system and downsize the farm and meet our customers one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, in 2019, we left the farm. We finally got my parents and the bank and everybody convinced that we were in too much debt to continue the way we were with the land we were farming. And we, we sold and moved to a 160-acre farm in Severy, where we now are one hour east of Wichita. Uh, the farm we're on today, it, as I said, it's 160 acres. We now market grass finished beef, lamb, pastured pork, chicken, duck. Uh, we have a small orchard, which we are, we're adding cats attached to it. We're adding as much diversity to it as we can. Um, it was a mono, it was an organic orchard when we moved here, but very, uh, very monoculture and, and still very industrialized, even though it's organic, heavily tilled, uh, you know, one species here, one species there. And we're, we're changing that as fast as we can. Uh, we're also very heavy into education. We started the Fuller Field School 11 years ago. Um, Abe, Peter, and Dee Dee have all been speakers at it, along with Walter and, and many other names that you would recognize. 
we draw attendees and speakers from all over the world. And, you know, we're, we're really proud of that of what's come out of our field school and the communities that we formed, the people we've met and the lives that we've touched along the way. So it's been, it's been quite a ride and certainly hasn't been boring, been a little scary at times, but it's, it's been, like I said, it's never been boring. Kat, I, I like Peter. First thing I would say is I, I'm exhausted listening to you speak. I, I think my life is busy and hectic and I, I can't hold a candle to what you're doing. And I, I question how you how you can keep it separate and together at the same time. And I also hope that you're you're taking care of yourself in the process because your plate is full. And um, it's become really apparent to Lynette and I, and, and we're now focusing on on regenerating farmers. We now realize that, you know, I've spent 20 years in this game of what was the soil health movement and now the regenerative ag movement and trying to regenerate my farm. And, and there's no such thing as a regenerative farm without a regenerative farmer. And what I've learned in the last 12 months, I've yet to see a regenerative farm, even though there's lots of farmers practicing regeneration because most of them are not working on themselves. So that's kind of where we are. One, one thing that kind of stuck out on your presentation and I'll, I'll end with this, you know, I, I just love how you're taking this full circle um, water, soil, below ground, above ground, food, you know, kid involvement, all that. Um, your comment on, on the meals that you're serving and still having to serve some, you know, some low end food and, you know, the, the pasta and things. I get that. Um, Lynette and I, when we started changing our diet, we, we certainly didn't make wholesale changes overnight because our system couldn't have taken it to begin with. It was a, it was a step-by-step -step process, but I think, you know, serving lousy food is only a lousy thing if you don't educate them along the way and and you know if you're talking about the 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 horrors of pasta or whatever it is that's on the plate that you know let them make the choice and just make sure they understand that where the nutrition is coming from on each plate that's that's the only thought i had so other than that it was a fantastic presentation and, and we learned a lot and by the way when that's at work but she is sitting over here listening in i think so she may she may pop in in a minute. Well, thanks, Gil, Richard, and then let's hear from Kathleen. So I'm Richard King. I live in Petaluma, California, and uh, I had worked for the the old Soil Conservation Service for 36 years, the Natural Resources Conservation Service. I believe they call themselves now, but they've become what I see as the natural resources contracting service <laughs> where they're spending all their time helping to um, helping to make sure the farm bill funds are going towards benefiting the farmers for conservation work that landowners are trying to accomplish. So that's a long story. I was a range specialist over the over that uh, time. I ended up on my great grandparents' old farm that uh, they had farmed to death since 1901 for dryland oat hay, and I'm having fun for the last 30 years rebuilding life above and below the soil surface. So that's that's been a great joy of mine. I also became familiar with Alan Savory and his work when I worked in Flagstaff, Arizona. And uh, so I'm a certified educator to help other people learn these ideas, how to use this framework. And I've developed uh, some good friendships here locally in the Petaluma area. And uh, there's a real interest in tackling policy issues. So, I'm using what I learned in Alan Savory's approach to policy making, policy analysis, as a way to to introduce these ideas um, to interested people. They may not even be policy makers, but we all make our own policies. <laughs> so what I've learned through that applies to all of us. 
So I'm having fun with that. And uh, I guess I've always learned the hard way by my mistakes. And from that, I've learned that it can be really important to go slow if I want to go fast. And uh, so I'm trying to approach things that I see as opportunities in a way that focuses on building the relationships with others. Because to me, that is the grease. That is what makes things happen and helps people become more comfortable learning new ideas and being open to new ideas. So um, I've had fun doing these learning or listening sessions with groups of people in the area and elsewhere in California. They've been extremely effective at building trust and helping people to ask better questions. So I'm looking forward to continuing that kind of work in my retirement from the USDA. <laughs> and the presentation, Kat, was, I guess the first thing I want to say is, man, can I, if this is recorded, can I share this with some other people? Because it's, uh, you know, this idea of possibility thinking as opposed to the kind of thinking we normally do with all the boxes that we see that we live within. Uh, possibility thinking is not a common beast in my life. And so, man, I can just imagine what could happen if we could share this kind of video with other people on what's possible. So thank you kindly for, for having shared what your life is about and uh, its effect on other people. It's, it's profound. Thank you. Kathleen, can we hear from? Uh, hi, <laughs> hi, everyone. Um, my name is Kathleen Kesson. I am here in Vermont. I'm an ardent fan of Kat's work in schools and uh, our work dovetails in many ways. I'm a retired professor emeritus of teaching, learning and leadership. So I'm probably the most amateur farmer in the group here. I have a huge home garden. Um, and in my writing and my work over 30 years in higher ed, I've been a big supporter of uh, environmental education and agricultural education. Um, I was a founding member of the Environmental Education Special Interest Group over 30 years ago in the American Educational Research Association. And in the 10 years that I was the director of education at Goddard College here in Vermont, I was a big supporter of school gardens and food works, which Kat probably remembers. Uh, people getting gardens in every school. And I did a pretty extended case study for the state of Vermont on integrating, integrating the curriculum through school gardens and agriculture. So um, I thought it was a, a great presentation, Kat. And um, I wanna talk to you independently. I wanna learn more about this land listening that you mentioned. And um, I'm currently uh, directing a program that I designed. It's an international program, and I have students in Asia, Africa, Latin America, mostly working in what's called third world schools, you know, uh, schools with populations of refugees and tribal people. And I'm writing a textbook for that course. Uh, it's a philosophy and practice of education for the Anthropocene. So this was a really timely presentation because I'm finishing up the chapter on STEAM education, which I have renamed as science, technology, ethics, art, and math. Um, and I, I want to include, I, I'm doing a section on the spiral curriculum where kids in a school setting encounter ideas at higher and higher levels throughout their primary education. So Kat, I too am really interested in this recording and hoping 
that we can figure out a way that I can extract the little piece that you did about Setford School because it's it's just really amazing work. It's so cutting edge and so important. So um, I'll contact you after this is over. I was really happy. I had another board meeting I was supposed to go to at noon and I thought, darn, I'm gonna miss Kat's presentation. And then they canceled that meeting. So that was a serendipity. Mm. So hang in there. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Kathleen. Jim. Uh, yeah, my, my name is Jim Laurie. I'm I'm in the Boston area. I'm in Malden right now. Um, I, I'm uh, in the 1990s. I was was learning from a guy named John Todd at New Alchemy Institute on how to clean uh, wastewater, and he was doing it with something he called living machines. And I was working at a chemical plant in Texas at the time, and I had some really nasty wastewater that I could get for free. And I had all kinds of lab people that uh, could study this stuff for free. And so it was a great opportunity. And we were making the cleanest water with biodiversity that they'd ever seen at the chemical plant. Not, not huge quantities, but we got the function of it. And the idea was, uh, I didn't know how to do this. John Todd didn't know how to do this. Nature knew how to do this. So I, I realized anybody could do that. And at the same time, I was going out to West Texas and trying to figure out where the land was getting better. And everybody that I found that, that was doing that was you know, associated with this guy named Savory. So I actually got to meet him and see some of the projects and some of the ranchers were teaching me. I then later went, you know, I ended up in New England working with John Todd, working on a sewage plant in a greenhouse for a while. And then I was out in California trying to figure out how do we restore the salmon streams and, and the redwood forests. And I got really involved in understanding how the mycelium works. So I'm really glad to hear the mycelium network and Kat's presentation. But that kind of changed everything about how to think about a forest. So in the meantime, oh, about 10 years ago, uh, we, we got Alan Savory to come to Boston and actually speak at Tufts, which is the first time he'd gone up in the academic world in a long time. And we made, you know, he was very, very, animated in, in Boston and wanted us to start a savory hub, which we couldn't afford. <laughs> but we started uh, something called Biodiversity for a Livable Climate. And my, my probably favorite mission is, is being a teacher. And I, I started teaching homeschoolers and started building, building things and had a little chemistry lab and so forth. But, uh, but then we had the COVID thing happen and these these homeschoolers were giving presentations in front of our bigger bigger conferences, but we're now Zoom conferences. And a lot of adults that were there says, "How come we can't get teaching like this?" So I've been teaching biodiversity classes. We read books. You know, I thought, well, if I can get people to come to twelve classes, we can learn a lot. But we've now we're now in our we've gone through seven courses of about eighty. 80 classes and some of them, some people have gone through the whole thing. Some people start at one class and just come to one, but it's kind of like what uh, you were saying, Kathleen, about this uh, spiral curriculum. I don't really have a curriculum, but when you, you, but you keep going around in circles and you start seeing the same thing and the same thing. And when you start hearing the same things over and over, that's really kind of cool. Um, so I don't know where this is, this is going other than, uh, the climate is changing much, much faster than we think it is, largely because of the heat. Heat is all being accumulated in the oceans. And that, that explains why the storms are getting bigger. The ocean has a fever and the storms are getting bigger. And we're, we're in a real fix right now. But, but photosynthesis is our ally. And I'm, I'm kind of wanting to come out with a rule that says no bare ground is allowed. So... Mm -hmm. So let's let's make sure that every photon that comes to the earth hits a leaf before it hits the soil. So that's a little bit about me and and thanks, Kat. It, it, it was quite amazing. To, yeah, I, I just had one question about the. You said there was a Northeast Soil Health Policy Network meeting. Is that is that at Tufts? Is that going to be at Tufts? Or? I think it's happening in New Hampshire. Oh, okay. I I did forward an email. I think I included um, everyone on the Soil Carbon Coalition, um, and that announcement just came out. Um, that's in March, did you say? I... It's in March. I think it's the 16th, so somewhere midway through March. I'll try to get some of um, our people. 
our, our group is also, we're, we've become really, we're becoming experts in Milwaukee forests. And my classes have inspired a lot of people to do that. We, we had Hannah Lewis just wrote a book. She was working with us for a while. And Hannah Lewis from Minnesota wrote a book about mini forests and the mini forest revolution. Mm -hmm. And our classes have been reading that. And, and there's probably half a dozen different Milwaukee projects, which is, you know, if you haven't heard that word, um, you know, I can bring you up to speed on that. So, so that sounds exciting. Yeah, yeah. Is you can build a mini forest anywhere. So uh, th that's that's enough for now. So, thanks. Well, th well, thanks, thanks, Jim. Um, and the the question that seemed to come up, Kat, for you is um, how do you do all this? Keep it connected and keep it separate. And I would also like to add a, a another thing for that is another another idea to throw out is that you appear to be very successful at creating what some people call communities of practice. In other words, not just, not just conversations, but where people are actually doing things. And I think that's, that's a huge necessity. Um, we have, you know, a, pro, a huge profusion of, of conferences and talking events these days, but the community of practice is where the rubber meets the road. Yeah. And I would be curious about your reflections about that, what you've learned about communities of practice and, and how they can be supported. Hmm. Okay, well, so the first question, how do I keep it all separated and connected? Um, I, I don't have a master plan. Um, I'm very intuitively directed, which can sometimes be a problem. Um, sometimes I have ideas <coughs> and then I just do them rather than sit on them. <laughs> and um, I guess I have exciting ideas because people like to get involved with them. I, 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 I guess I, this gets into sort of the, the, the second question and um, so I, I, I do love the concept of ecosystem mimicry. And I have, since I was a child, felt that there was some big information that was being withheld from me. Um, and school didn't teach it. And I decided not to go to college. I, I, am, I have no college at all. 100% experientially educated. And I think that might have something to do with why I'm approachable um, and why people want to come and help do what I'm doing. I think it also has helped me to take risks because I don't know any better. I wasn't designed into a neat little box. And so I'm pretty eager to reach outside of it. Um, and I think one of the things I listed in my things that I've learned is that professionalism is a tool to keep people oppressed. And um, I try to push through that and be silly and real in groups of professionals. And I think it's welcomed and I have nothing to lose. Um, I've carefully not gotten myself employed by an organization because I don't want to be bound to their rules of professionalism or their confines of their particular vision. Um, I've done that before, but instead I decided to start my own business with absolutely no understanding of how to do that. And it's worked. I don't make a lot of money. Um, and I I'm really good at living without a lot of money. I'm living in a 10 by 12 foot house right now. Um, and I like beans and rice. And, um, but I am learning um, how to take care of myself, Gail. I'm learning and I am realizing that, oh good. <laughs> um, I am realizing that money is important. I own land now and I have a mortgage. And so, you know, I, I am learning to work with other organizations to 
break through this professionalism idea and say, let's stop competing to educate our kids. Let's lift each other up. Let's pool our resources. Let's work together. Let's throw away our individual organizational missions and actually shift the paradigm. And I think that's exciting for people. I think it's welcoming. Um, so I think so. I mean, I guess, honestly, the answer is my ignorance, <laughs> I think, is a great leader. Um, and Peter, that's something I've learned from you, that, you know, ignorance is something to embrace. Um, and I really appreciate that lesson. Um, and I, you know, I have so many teachers, um, many on this screen. Kathleen, I'm so glad you're here. You're a huge mentor for me. Um, ah, vice versa. <laughs> ah, I love it. I love it. Let's talk more. Um, yeah, so um, I, I'm really excited that you created this opportunity, Peter. I've never before sat down and put all the stuff I do together in a presentation. Um, the first time I ever thought about all the work I do was my first employee, who her name was Lauren Weston. Some of you may know her. Um, this young woman came to one of my presentations and said, I want to work for you. And I laughed at her. <laughs> I was like, you mean for money? And uh, so she volunteered for me for about a year. And then I started paying her and she redesigned my website and she sat me down and separated all the stuff I do. She's like, this is Kat Buxton. This is Apple Corps. This is Vermont Healthy Soils Coalition and help me understand my identity. So um, I've had help from a lot of great teachers. Um, not, you know, some are, some of my greatest teachers are the young ones in my life. They're certainly my greatest inspiration. Well, thank you, Kat. Um, this has been wonderful. Um, Anna, I've, I've learned a lot. And as, as Richard says, possibility thinking and ignorance, that these are these are great, great tools. And Thank you for reminding us all of them. For closing, can we just have a couple of words from everybody about what they've learned or what they've been inspired by? Start with you, Jim, and go the other way. Oh. Social mycelium, Abenaki forests, uh, turning the polo grounds into something real. So I thought that was that was quite special. Richard. I'm biased towards having fun and I really <laughs> enjoy all the possibilities of just having more fun and making the changes that are helpful to everyone. Everyone. And it's, um, yeah, it's got all kinds of challenges from every direction and every which way, but Man, when you realize how fun and satisfying and gratifying it can be to do the tough things, jump in and just start doing it. That's what I relearned. Thank you. Kathleen. Um, I really like, Kat, what you're saying about breaking down the barriers that professionalism creates. Mm -hmm. And I would add bureaucracy to that. Uh, a lot of my work in Vermont is really around uh, creating community schools and how to get sort of ordinary people like farmers and musicians and blacksmiths really highly engaged with the education of young people because teachers are educated to be professionals and they often have a very limited academic discipline understanding, you know, whereas ordinary people have the skills and the knowledge that kids need for this just transition. So I love that idea. I'm also intrigued with land listening. I want to learn more about that because I guess the big issue that occupies my mind these days is how do we decenter the human, you know, from the sort of anthropocentric mastery and control model to a more interconnected relational model with the non-human world. So I think there's a, a key for me there in this land listening. So I want to learn more. 
Thanks. Thanks, Kathleen. By the way, there's a um, a link on our SoilCarbonCoalition.org website about land listening, but Ooh. everybody has everybody has their own way of doing that, and and I really appreciate what Cat has contributed to that too. So, but it's Peter, a sort of general. Peter, I, just, I had one other comment. I thought uh, the best picture in this whole presentation I thought was when all the kids are trying to show off how dirty their hands could get. <laughs> That's right. That's a paradigm. That's a paradigm shift right there. So I thank you. Yeah. Well, I've, well, I've learned things too. So yeah. thank you all. Well, thank you, Kat, and thank thanks, Kathleen, and and please please do um, keep in touch if you have questions or something that. And um, I really appreciate Kat you sharing all this, and uh, 